I'd just like to formally welcome you to Edgehill University. I always say when I come here, it's one of the prettiest universities I've ever been to. I love coming here because it's just such a nice vibe about the place as well. This is our Agents of Change event and it's all for International Women's Day, which I'm sure you know all about. Uh, but if you don't, Edgehill as well has had a really sort of strong link with women since it was set up in 1885 and it had part of the suffragette movement as well. And it's all about raising women's aspirations and in particular, young girls like yourselves. So we've got a very special panel here of women who have made a difference in their particular fields today. So I'll introduce you to them and then they're going to speak a little bit more about what they've done. And I know some of you have put questions forward, so we will get your questions questions later on and if you've not already submitted a question don't worry because if you think of something make sure later on you pop your hand up and we'll come to you and we can make sure that all your questions are answered. Uh, so we have Natalie Denny who is the founder of Project Period Merseyside joining us. She's going to speak in a moment. We also have Alice Jackson, founder of Strutsafe here as well. You may have seen some of these women on the TV because a lot of them do a lot of media as well. And Michelle Livesey who is responsible for Claire's Law as well which we're going to hear much more about. Uh, so yeah, Natalie, do you want to start us off today? Yeah, that's fine. Um, so hi everyone, my name's Natalie Denny. I am the founder of the Period Project Merseyside, which was founded in 2016 now. Um, and the way it started was that I was watching um, something on Facebook, as you do when you <laughs> scroll. Um, and I came across a video that talked about homeless women um, when they um, were experiencing their period and the lengths that they had to go to to provide for themselves. Um, and they were doing things like um, choosing between foods. Um, and menstrual items, they were using, you know, makeshift tampons that we were making out of pads, which was also really un unhygienic and also not safe. Um, and some woman, you know, an older woman, um, I always remember this really vividly, she says sometimes she just sits in the doorway and tries not to move, and that was her sort of way of dealing. Um, and I just started thinking about how horrendous that must be. Um, the, the women were using public bathrooms to clean themselves, um, and it just seemed another additional thing that they had to worry about on top of the complexity of being homeless. Um, and it was something that I had never, ever thought about before, and I remember it being a really vivid memory, because I was just like, now, myself sometimes I'm you know um, whinging with me hot water bottle um, and, and really in a lot of pain and I just thought imagine if you didn't even have your sort of creature comforts like your shower your your home and stuff like that so um, I started researching the topic a little bit and speaking to a few people locally and regionally and saying you know is there anything that addresses this need within our communities at the moment and i come across an organization called the homeless period um, Liverpool, um, homeless period but one was based in london i think one was based um, in birmingham as well and they were called homeless period birmingham and what they were doing were provide menstrual packs to people who needed them they were going out and making sure that people had things like underwear like wipes like whether it be in pads or tampons and things like that so i contacted them and just said this is something i'd really like to you know do within the liverpool or the merseyside region um, and they were like yep yeah. they were really helpful they sent me all of their assets all of their information you know lots of instructions but they said the first thing you need to do is see if there's a need for this with your organizations because what you don't want is to put a big call out for lots of tampons and nowhere to put them <laughs> so um that's what i did and we contacted food banks and um, at the time in Liverpool there were 16 homeless street teams who were going out nearly every night um, to support people who were homeless um, and we spoke to them and they were just like we never have enough money to buy menstrual items it's always an afterthought so this would be amazing the same for the food banks and the women's refuges and places like that so it was a much needed um, thing and at this point in 2016 period poverty wasn't this sort of word that was really freely available to, to roll off people's tongue you know one has actually ever really heard of it it was like period poverty it was always kind of met with a little bit of a confusion so it, we were doing something that was really really different so what we ended up doing then um, is setting ourselves up um, contacting the organizations putting a call out and we started off really basic all we were doing was providing menstrual items for people who needed them that was just our baseline that's what we were doing and um, so we started off with a meeting of four people in my little pink living room in my old flat and um, with tampons everywhere you know <laughs> all of us like doing a little production line and we made something like 80 packs and they just went like that you know we done the deliveries and they went so we started putting pink bins in places like news from nowhere which is on build street within liverpool big love sister and people really took the idea and ran with it really supported us 
um, and we had lots of donations. So what we ended up doing then is connecting with the University of um, Liverpool and their Feminist Society, as well as the University of um, John Moores as well. Um, they were really, you know, captivated by this idea and they sort of really supported us with, you know, having rooms for our meetings. So we went in a year from being four people in my little pink living room to having um, 100 people in Malford Hall, um, all working together to provide packs. And then we were getting more and more requests, more and more people were asking for our services. Um, so we completely sort of expanded and built a committee. And one of the things that happened for us was that we had a bit of an education along the way. You might see, to see how I use the word menstrual packs. We don't use the word sanitary. Um, we're really clear with our language because we started educating ourselves around sort of the history of menstruation and how this idea that, you know, corporations were leading the charge on this and sort of it was all to do with capitalism and it was all to do with, um, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen an advert, it was only in the last couple of years that the advert have actually started using blood. It's always been blue because it's just so horrendous <laughs> to see a bit of blood on the telly. Um, so there was a, we understood that there, it wasn't just for us, period poverty, which is lack of funds. There was a, what we call a toxic trio. So it was the idea of it being, yes, lack of access and of funds, but also lack of access because you feel too ashamed and embarrassed to actually have the conversation or request some support. Um, because we've had times where we've had packs and people haven't asked for them because they're so embarrassed and um, because if they think it's something to be ashamed about. So there's the stigma and taboo, but there's also the education around biology, around bodies, but also about the fact that this is something that, you know, about 50% of the population experience. So why are we making it such this big taboo thing? So we started educating ourselves and the idea of the word sanitary makes out that, you know, it's unsanitary. Yeah, so clean, isn't it? Clean, yeah. this idea of cleanliness. So we changed a lot the way we, we operated and we'd, we'd given out thousands of packs but what we were finding in the rooms is when we were bringing people together it was predominantly women but it was people everyone we were bringing people together intergenerationally we were having lots of contacts it become a networking opportunity but also become a place where people really supported and you know had a great time with each other so I was doing a really demanding job at the time where I was traveling to the likes of Teesside and coming back and then coming straight from there to the meetings and being really exhausted but when we were there I was felt so uplifted so we started doing things like wonderful women events where we done 10 minutes each where everyone could bring something whether it be a musical instrument a project they were working on and lots of work together and um, so we started that element of stuff and once we started educating ourselves we thought why are we actually doing this why should we as people from the community be meeting a need that actually isn't our responsibility to meet so we started thinking about there's many places in the game um, that have made maybe projects free the po um, products free the point of access so scotland are leading the charge at the moment northern ireland and um, passed legislation there and what's really interesting about northern ireland is they they started a year after us but one of their girls went to university in liverpool and come to our meeting and that's how she got interested and then she went home to northern ireland and then started working with her mps and things like that and then they've outstripped england already because of the campaign that she run so we started learning a lot about it and understanding and thinking that actually I love the Perry Project Mersey side. The committee are all really good friends. We've been together for a long time. We've got academics there. We've got um, people from all different backgrounds who are fantastic. But I don't want to be doing this in even two years anymore. Not because I don't love what I do, but because there should not be a need for it. We do need to think a little bit more strategically about how we are addressing things like period of poverty. And while providing packs is all well and good, and we will never stop doing that because if people need them, it's not what we should be doing. So we shifted our attention more to campaigning, and um, to lobbying, to doing stuff that raises awareness, to looking at education. We so we have around about three years ago we completely and I say rebranded because but it doesn't really sound right, but we did. We changed from the homeless period Liverpool to the period project Mercy side. We had three main strands. The first one is providing the menstrual products and having them packing meetings where people come together and make them. Because from a volunteer perspective, People really love getting involved and doing something really physical that they can do and then go home. And we are really appreciative of that. But then the people who want to get involved a little bit more, we have a campaigning and academic angle. We've got about three different academics and um, doctors on our um, committee who are doing research around things that are linked to this type of area that are doing exhibitions and things like that to raise um, awareness. And we're also looking at contacting the schools, for example, to 
There's a campaign at the moment which allows every school and college to access free menstrual products, but the take-up in this country is about 40%. The issue there is that they have to opt in, whereas the likes of Northern Ireland and Scotland, they don't have to opt in. Everyone just gets onto the programme. So this is a barrier in itself because you're asking teachers and schools that already have quite a lot on the plate to then have to go and opt into a campaign rather than just saying every school in England can have this and, and we'll deliver stuff to them. So there's that element of stuff as well. And we're doing stuff with corporations and businesses, which we're launching um, in the next week called The Period Promise, which is about businesses you know raising the profile providing products in their buildings in displaying our photo, our posters and stuff with myth busters and things like that just to get it on the radar for that as well so there's the campaign and angle that we've got and we're also trying to get the law changed so we're trying to lobby and campaign to try and look at um england providing menstrual products to all three and at the minute it's a, it's a hard battle because it's something that it's not really mentioned we've sort of linked in with the sort of support of the all parliamentary group and you know menstruation was mentioned last year in parliament twice um twice <laughs> yeah so it's something that's not on the agenda but because of the current cost of living crisis that we're in all of the figures that we originally were already dire around this area have been condensed so you're having people who are struggling even more so so and the third strand really is to sort of support events and activities that um celebrate and empower women so whether it's international women's day or wonderful women's events we also support like trans pride events reclaim events anything that sort of empowers people at periods um, so that's sort of what we are now and what we're working towards at the moment and it's been quite a journey we started off with these little sort of like naive people that just wanted to make a difference <laughs> and help someone with a few tampons to um let's take the government down I'm really joking <laughs> <laughs> that's the so it, I don't know if the rest of you think hearing you speak you have this little idea because you saw something and it ignited something in you and you thought do you know, I've never thought, and do you know what, when you were talking there, I thought, I've never actually thought about that, how do homeless women access any of this? So you saying that made me think about it. So you set up this small project and it's just grown into this huge juggernaut of a thing trying to change everything. Did you ever, before that, ever think you would be in a state where you are campaigning to government? Have you ever done anything like that before? Or is it just, you know, you learn as you have gone along? Um, so I've always sort of been involved in activism on some level. I mean, originally it was a youth worker. And I think when you are a youth worker and you work with young people, you naturally are aware of the issues that happen, especially when you grow up in an area that um, economically, you know, yeah. isn't doing very well. You start sort of thinking about why does people have no money? <laughs> why <laughs> is it set up like that? And rather than sort of drift towards it, an individual's fault, you understand the strategic and institutional nature of, you know, poverty and how it manifests itself and the intergenerational way of it as well. So I think I was always really interested in supporting people and making things a little bit better for people, whether it be through the youth work that I was doing or sort of any other, the other projects. And I was always sort of wanting to you know physically see how i could either if whether it be direct action to attend something or whether it be helping out with any of the skills that i had um but when it comes to the period project mercy side i never thought that it would be periods <laughs> that it'd be like <laughs> being like oh i'm a period girl so i never thought that and even now it feels a bit strange saying it and i think for me i think why it feels strange is that we've completely normalized this you know the way we yeah. talk about it exactly. the way we talk about it in our circles you know i've got lots of male friends and i openly talk about this all the time yeah. so but they it should be open. Yeah. i mean when i was at school it was very much and when you had the talk at school you were taken off into a little room and it was all done very see as if it was kind of some magical mystical thing that we couldn't talk about but you know when you're speaking to i don't know do you speak to mps and when you're speaking to sort of people involved in the government how do they react are they still a little bit embarrassed oh, about gosh, it yeah it's still um <laughs> There's still a lot of stigma and taboo around periods and there's still people who just don't get period poverty. They're just like, well, it's not really a thing. You can go to the corner shop and get a 59p pad. And it's like, it's not looking at the bigger picture because first of all, I wouldn't recommend a 59p pad to anyone if I'm honest with you. Um, and also this idea that they don't understand the toxic trio of period poverty. They're just talking about one element of it and there's a lack of understanding. Um, I think people don't see it as that much of a big deal, but I feel like we've got this um, 
infographic that we use on our training and education sessions and it's um, people flying on tampons <laughs> that's gorgeous <laughs> um but you've got you know scotland there right at the front leading the charge you've got um northern ireland just behind and then you've got um in Wales there and then you've got England right at the back and it can be done you know the arguments are there it can be done it will make people's lives better for everyone I think one of the reasons why this blew up in a, it was a couple of years ago I think it was Amika George she led the free periods campaign but hers was focused specifically on children school children because there was research that came out that showed I think it was research was based in Leeds that showed that um, kids were missing school um, because of it, so they were missing out on like twenty percent of their education. They wouldn't talk about it. They wouldn't go in. So instead, when they couldn't afford it, or because of what they were experiencing, they just wouldn't go to school, and it was having a massive impact. And that's when the government made the changes. And I think the way they've made the changes and done the, the sort of um, campaign, it's half bothered. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. not. It's not really as far as it needs to go. You know, even the idea of opting in is a barrier. Um, the government pledged, I think it was 250k over a couple of years, which in the dro is a drop in the ocean really yeah. for this. Um, we don't know what's going on with that. So a lot of sort of what's happening at the minute is it's getting hushed and pushed aside, not seen as a big anything that's important. But we know that the figures are getting worse. We talk to people, you know, regularly about how our packs or just our source of support helps them. Um, we, we've, through COVID, we continued operating. We all just did deliveries with our cars to people's homes or to organisations and stuff because we found another way to help. Um, so, you know, we're constantly getting asked for support. Um, so it's definitely something that can make a change to people's lives. And my sort of view on all this is, if we can make people's lives better, why don't we? You know, why don't we? What's, what's, what's holding simple. us back? It's simple yeah. and it's really a simplised way of looking. And that is what the sort of premise of the Period Project Merseyside is. We just want to make people's lives better and have something that's quite normalised and should be quite normalised, not to be a massive barrier to education, engagement, or just sort of reaching your potential in general. Yeah, I know we've got lots of questions for you a bit later on this afternoon, so I don't want to take any of your questions. But I guess just before we move on to Alice, briefly, how... You know, anyone listening here that wants to get involved or wants to just help you make a change, what should they do? Should they write to their local MP? Should yeah. they? Yeah, so there's loads there of ways you can get involved. <laughs> I think um, we are currently um, holding campaigning meetings and things like that because we have lots of volunteers who love the packing events, but when it comes to the longer scale campaigning, they haven't got sort of the commitment to do that because of just what they're involved in in general. So we're looking for people at the moment who will help us with the schools campaign, in contacting all of the schools. We're looking for people who are going to be involved with the corporate side of it in terms of our, the period promise that we're launching. So if people want to directly contact us, we are on Twitter, Instagram, we are, we've got a website, we've got an email, um, and we always look for people to come along and help out or when we're having our events it helps if people come to our meetings because well we're all voluntary at the moment so you know we're volunteering we've been voluntary i think we, we celebrate our eighth birthday in may um so we do so many different things so it would be great if instead of people emailing us loads of individually if when we had the meetings people physically come along and got involved and took away tasks and stuff because i think for us to actually make a difference it's going to actually require bodies on the ground and sort of people involved in sort of making this change and um, but yeah you can write to your mp um, and talk about this issue because if it is put on the radar because it is usually through the mps how we mm. end up sort of getting somewhere because that's the way the lord of the land is in this country and the way politics works so you can write to your mp but what helps is is if people do it en masse because it shows that there's more than one person that this is an issue for so we would say definitely write to your mp talk about it openly if you have got social media accounts and things like that you can do that online and if you are a type of person that thinks you know that activism way isn't for me just having conversations in your immediate groups with people that you do feel confident with so that it puts it on the radar a little bit. Are you aware of this? Have you heard this before? What do you think about that? Do you think there should be free? You know, using them little arguments. You know, contraception, for the most part, is free um, from our sort of um, clinics and things like that. Everyone uses toilet roll and wouldn't expect to bring their own toilet roll to a toilet. So why do we expect people to bring their own menstrual items? So this is just for me, and that's a really simple little snippet of a way that you can have a conversation with someone that might make people sow the seeds to have them conversations. It's going to take a group effort and there's going to be varying levels to how we will make the change. 
within this country. Yeah, I think you're going to make that change because you're absolutely fantastic just to <laughs> listen to. And yeah, well done to Ed Chill as well because I noticed the period products are free here as well. So well done. <laughs> and I know there's a lot of questions coming for you later on, but for now we're going to move on. But let's have, just have a quick round of applause for Natalie and Debbie. Thank you. Yeah, I think you can already see that we've got some brilliant women here that just, you know, are changing how society works. And another one is Alice Jackson, and you're going to tell us about StrutSafe. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Alice Jackson, and I'm one of the co-founders of StrutSafe. Um, StrutSafe is an organisation that I co-founded nearly, it's our second birthday on the 15th. Um, I co-founded with my friend Ro Chung. Um, and we co-founded StrutSafe following the murder of Sarah Everard by Wayne Cousins back in March of 2021. The anniversary was actually four days ago now, on March, on March the 3rd. Um, and we, I had a, actually a background in contraception and, and things like that. Um, I, when I'd been at university, so I started StrutSafe when I was still at university, which was terrible idea <laughs> and i was supposed to be encouraging everybody to uh to get encouraged like involved in activism right now please finish your dissertations just before you do it <laughs> please um but it was one of those things where the, um, a moment happened but i've been working in university um working within an organization which you should also check out called cert scotland which is the contraceptive education reform team scotland um, and they are an organization that uh, educates, provides resources, commissions research into contraception and its effects um, because it's so much of it is a really opaque process. Um, so I was working in that and that was kind of my very minor background in stuff like this. Um, and then I, um, the murder of Sarah Everard um, hit the news and I think hit all of us. It was such a horrible and, and traumatic event and this is an issue I've been passionate about for a long time um, but had never really been actively involved in but I attended a vigil for Sarah Everard in Edinburgh with my friend uh, Ro and we came home from that vigil um, and the atmosphere at it had been one of just immense grief and pain um, and real confusion because um, I think people were confused as to how this had come to happen. Um, at that point, we didn't even know the full details as they would emerge that it, had been, it was a crime that had been enacted by a serving Metropolitan Police officer. And we were sharing in that confusion and, that, and how someone can't do something as simple as walk home without being at risk, without being threatened. And Ro got up um, on the bullhorn at this vigil and said, if anyone ever needs my help, they're alone, they feel unsafe, um, come and call me, find me, and I will get you a cab, I will come and get you, I will do whatever I can. Um, and that night we were, we were speaking, and I said, were you serious? Because I think you were. And they said, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. Um, I want to make good on that promise. And I said, okay, good, because I'm as serious as you are. <laughs> Let's do something. Please don't put your personal phone number out anywhere in public. <laughs> uh, that's not safe. Um, why don't we make a number for people to call? And I went, okay. And we came up with a name, um, StratSafe. And the next day, Ro went and bought a burner phone and bought a number and a SIM. And we started sharing the number locally. We just said to everybody we knew, um, and we told like, local pubs and put on the kind of local Facebook groups in your area, you know, buy, sell, or rent, etc. cetera. Um, this is a number. This is a number, and you can call it, and we will stay on the phone with you, or we will come and get you. And the response from people who we knew was immediate and unbelievable. People got in touch saying, oh, well, if you need someone to man the phone when, I, when you aren't doing it, I'll do it. I'll, can I do it? Like, yeah. And they were like, oh, and if you need someone to you know, go and get people, can, can I get involved? 
And very quickly we realized that um, this was something that people wanted to be involved in, but also people wanted to rely on. You know, we were operational within three weeks of our founding on a burner phone, and then suddenly <laughs> realized that we had so many calls coming in and that um, the response on social media had gone far beyond Edinburgh. <laughs> And our original plan had been to meet people and walk with them, you know, go and find someone and, and accompany them. But we very quickly realized that um, it got picked up by a few local news stations and radio stations and a few local papers. But obviously, in this age that we live in, word spreads really quickly. And suddenly we had people calling saying, look, I live in London, but you don't come and get me. Um, <laughs> 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 Two hour train down late, four hour train. Um, uh, but can, I, can, you, can you stay on the phone with me? And we were like, of course. And then we realized that that was actually what people needed. That was the gray area between doing something like calling the emergency services or the authorities and just muscling through a feeling of discomfort or a feeling of actually feeling you know, very threatened or upset. So we suddenly realized that, again, it was one of those things that just started in the local community as trying to help people in your community and then just grew and we realized that so we were operating UK wide, we were fielding you know, hundreds of calls a month. Um, and so we very quickly moved away from the burner phone, which was not sustainable. And we got a switchboard line and then um, we had a decent social media following to start with. And then I made this infographic that just said need a walk home and it was red and it had the number on it. And um, we shared it and we had a couple of thousand followers. And then I woke up the next morning and we had about 25,000 because <laughs> a number of celebrities um, had shared it. And suddenly the number had like 100,000 likes and we'd only had a very, very small thing and it was being shared on every story. Um, and then we got picked up by things like major news outlets. And something that emerged very quickly was that we realize that we are the only service in the world that exists like this. So Stratsafe operates three nights a week. Um, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night, it offers, operates from 7 p.m. Um, on a Friday and Saturday to 3 a.m. on a Friday and Saturday, and then from 7 p.m. to 1 a.m. on a Sunday. Um, nothing else like this exists in the world. There's only one now, uh, which is in Poland, which was set up because they contacted us and said, can we do this? And I went, sure. Um, so we're the only you know, thing filling this gap, and it's been a, a pretty unbelievable two years. Um, and one of the major, I think, criticisms of a number like Strutsafe is that what is this actually doing to solve the problem? You know, if you're walking home and you feel unsafe, you can call Strutsafe and someone will stay on the phone with you until you're home. What is that doing about the wider problem, about things like misogyny, things like violence against women, public sexual harassment? Um, and we completely agree with that criticism because it is correct. It is a sticking plaster to a symptom of a wider societal problem. You know, misogyny is ingrained and embedded in every single part of our society. That's something we need to root out and solve. That takes education, that takes legislation, that takes time and understanding and work, um, which I now do separately. Sometimes it's part of Stratsafe because campaigning and awareness of the service and of the number is important. And um, I find it sometimes a little offensive when people criticize the number because I'll say to them, are you criticizing the people who call? Are you criticizing people who want to rely on a service like this? Because that's what we're trying to do at the end of the day is to be there for people. We have things like emergency protocols in place where with the permission of someone, if they feel unsafe, we can redirect them to the emergency services. We can call the emergency services on their behalf. That is something we are capable of doing. Um, we have volunteers that are thoroughly, thoroughly trained and highly vetted and background checked to deal with this, who understand the nature of the issue. It's not going to be somewhere where you call and people aren't going to understand what you're going through. Um, we don't want anyone to feel unsafe walking home. Um, and so I've moved in my, in my sort of separate work. My job is now in things like campaigning and legislation. Um, I have been part of a number of legislative campaigns. I primarily work in Scotland because uh, Stratsafe is actually based out of Edinburgh, where I live, um, and obviously Scottish and English and Welsh law, as we were talking about, is very, very different. Um, and so there are some ways in which Scotland is far, far ahead, but there are some things that have been left out of legislation that are so, so, so far behind. Things like the rough sex defence, we don't have, that's still something that you can do in Scotland, and public sexual harassment is still legal in Scotland. So tomorrow I'm hosting a reception at the Scottish Parliament calling on lawmakers to support a bill. Um, that I am in the middle of kind of writing uh, to pass it to basically put in place educational measures for 
uh, like legislative protections and an educational solution to public sexual harassment. Um, we're pursuing that because we know that things like misogyny aren't solved by finding someone, um, unfortunately, as England and Wales have decided to do. Um, they're not solved by putting someone in prison. Um, there's a wonderful project in Scotland called the Caledonian Project, um, which is a project for men who have committed acts of domestic abuse. And it's an educational rehabilitative pro a rehabilitative project where men are basically enter this project and it's an attempt to undo all those ideas and to basically combat the experiences that they've had that have caused them to do this behavior. And we know that things like that work in a much more effective way in terms of preventing reoffending, in terms of making communities safer. You know, people don't exist in a vacuum. People commit these acts because they had experiences that have meaning they're taking it out on other people because they heard rape jokes or sexist jokes and thought this is an appropriate way to speak about people. Um, so that's kind of what I do, uh, <laughs> in a nutshell. Not very much, not really a nutshell, was it? But um, yeah, so that's kind of strut safe. Um, the number is also, I should say, this was something that we were really, really are always clear on because um, I think people misconstrue it a lot. The number is for everyone. Like anybody can call. And we have people of all kind of, from all walks of life who answer. Like it can be, we have young male university students and we have your gran who's not out on a Saturday night and so she thinks, well, I might as well volunteer. Um, and it's completely free to call, it's completely non-judgmental, and it will always be free, and it will always be for everybody. Um, because at the end of the day, we just want to make our community safer, we want to support the people in our communities, even though that community is now UK-wide, and we want everyone to be able to get home feeling safe. Um, so that's a little bit about what I do. Yeah, it, it's absolutely fantastic project. And as you say, you know, the Sarah Everard murder, I think anyone who saw that, it, it stuck with them because it was something so simple, you know, walking home. We should be allowed to walk home. And what was your reaction the first time you got that criticism? Because that sort of stuck with me then when you were talking to say that people say, well, this isn't sorting the problem out at all. Well, actually, you know, it's not, but it's allowing women to have that little bit of freedom that they should be allowed. So I don't know, what was your reaction when you first got, were you quite shocked that there would be any criticism of this? Um, no, because I think people really enjoy <laughs> tearing down anything a woman does. Um, <laughs> but no, I mean, it's a, very, it's a valid criticism. And that's the thing, it's, it's, this is like, like, like I was saying, it's a sticking plaster on a symptom of a much, much deeper problem. Um, and I think that the response to that is, yeah, you're right. And so what are you doing about the wider issue? You know, what are you, what are you doing in your day-to-day -day life? What campaigns are you leading? What projects are you starting? How are you fighting domestic abuse or period poverty or violence against women? And that's not in any way to excuse yourself, but that's just to say we all are aware of this problem, clearly. We all see the statistics. We all read the reports. We all read, you know, the news articles that go over, sometimes in excruciating and painful depth, the reality and the pain and suffering of the situation that we're dealing with. Currently, a woman is murdered in the UK by a man once every 2.7 days. It's actually, the average has just gone up. It was 1.3, three years ago. Um, sorry, it was, in, it was uh, one woman every three days, now it's 2.7. Um, and if that was being, was happening at a similar rate to any other group of people, it would be, if for example it was happening the other way around, it would be classed as a national emergency. But the fact is, is that we are aware of this problem, we have normalized it so much that it's not a national emergency, it's society. And so it takes all of us being a big part of that change. And like you were saying, it's not just like, I love my job and I'm really glad that I do what I do and I have so many, we have so many amazing people who volunteer, completely normal people who just volunteer on their sofas for a couple of hours on a Sunday night. But it takes, it can take something so small. It can take calling out a joke in your friendship group. It can take calling out a joke from an authority figure, standing up to those things and saying, actually, I don't think it's appropriate to talk about people like that. Or do you understand the significance of what you're saying? And all of that, that is what leads it. It just takes all of us because it's affecting all of us. So it'll take all of us to change it. How many calls do you get roughly, say, on a Saturday night? Do you know that? 
do you know sort of is it yeah. but it's more than we think <laughs> it's so it's 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 very high i mean it obviously varies unfortunately we usually see um spikes when something terrible happens in the news we saw a spike following the sentencing of wayne cousins we saw a spike following the murder of sabina nessa um and so it it does vary but we have people who call regularly um and we have people from all ages who call i think one of the you know, I still volunteer on the lines when I have the time, um, mostly because my entire life is swallowed by work, so actually I don't have much to do on a weekend. <laughs> um, but we get people calling as young as, um, as young as 10 or 11. That was the youngest call that I ever took. Um, we get a number of people in school coming home from after school clubs, coming home from swimming or sport after school, coming home from doing homework at a friend's house. Um, and the, the calls are, are 10 and 11. Um, it was two girls who called me and they were 10 and 11 and that has always really stuck with me um, because it's incredibly um, emotional, it's kind of the right word, to be on the phone with someone as they're experiencing the feeling that they will always move through the world differently. I remember when I first started experiencing things like public sexual harassment when I was in school, when I was in my school uniform, when I was about 14, 15. You don't understand it at that age because you are a child. You should be protected from something like that, but I wasn't. And so it's this feeling of solidarity and understanding with that person, a sense of relief that you are now, there is a service that now exists that didn't exist when I was going through that stuff when I was a teenager. Um, and definitely an inspiration to push for change even more to push harder to go further to go faster to pressure mps to pressure local authorities um, and to deal with the problem and it's not getting better in some ways i think with i know i'll speak to many of you in the room and you'll be like oh my god but think figures like andrew tate who seem to be dominating so much in schools and having this grip <laughs> These are terrible people, <laughs> um, and they're having an impact that we, you know, that we can actually visibly, tangibly see. I have a friend that so I'm graduated university about a year ago, just over a year ago, and friends who graduated at the same time have now gone into teaching. And um, a friend of mine who is now a teacher has had young men in school tell her that she's she's not fit to be teaching them because she's a woman and she's stupid, and women aren't as smart as men. So what do they have to learn from her? And if that behavior is being carried out towards teachers, can you imagine how severe it is to their peers who are women? To their peers who are women who are younger than them? And can you imagine the effect that that's having on the other boys in their class? And thinking, oh, well, if it's acceptable to treat a woman like this, well, then it's acceptable to make sexual comments to her or to touch her inappropriately. Or it's acceptable to behave in a way that's violent. Because all these little acts of behavior, all these little acts of behavior that seem like jokes that aren't properly dealt with, that aren't considered to be important or dramatic, you can brush off, you can dismiss, it's only a joke, no, don't take it so seriously. All of that, it just starts to seep out and it starts to permit increasingly violent or increasingly aggressive or increasingly sexually like violent acts of behavior. And all of that, you move up the pyramid. And if you can stop and undermine that behavior at a really, really young age, then you don't reach things like the case of Sarah Everard. Wayne Cousins didn't just immediately go out and decide to kill a woman. <laughs> We saw yesterday, it was yesterday that he was sentenced for cases of indecent exposure. And the, one of the women who he indecently exposed himself to said, if this had been dealt with properly, Sarah Everard might still have been alive. If you dealt with the low level behavior, if you dealt with the early signs that this man was a violent misogynist, Sarah might still be with her today, with us today. She was from York, which is where I'm from. And that's always stayed with me, that she lived on a road that my friend now lives on. Yeah. It's that, that personal, it's, ma it's making somebody real, isn't it? And she was a real person. And again, you know, like Natalie, it's such a simple idea, helping other women feel confident, feel safe, and it's just a fantastic thing. Let's hear it for, for Alice Jackson as well. Okay, yeah, I hope this is inspiring some of you to, to realise that it only takes one little thing to make a change. And our third and final panellist did just that as well. Michelle Livesey was instrumental in getting Claire's Law up and running. So if you just tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, so, oh, this is working, yeah. Um, so I'm a journalist and I'm based in Manchester and I was working um, as a reporter in a, in a busy patch of Manchester. 
and you know often I'd get called to the scene of crimes that have happened so um, this particular crime was the murder of a woman uh, called Claire Wood who uh, was based in Salford which obviously fell into my patch so you get the press release through from the police that says a woman's body's been found in a house and um, as a reporter, you know, you go to the scene, you report from the scene, there was a cordon in place, and, and that's all we knew at that stage, that a 36-year-old woman's body had been found. So, as we got more details, it turned out she was a mum. Then it turned out that, um, the, that they put a name out of the person they were looking for, said she was known to, uh, he was known to her. Um, interestingly, on the press release, it said at the bottom, this is believed to be a domestic incident which I just think, why are police putting that on? Like, does it matter that it's a domestic incident? But anyway, that's bad to buy. So they put out the guy's name that they, they associated with Claire, who they, they obviously wanted, um, and there was a massive manhunt for him. And loads of details came out, which doesn't normally come out this quickly in news. You, you have to do a lot of digging, obviously, um, and you have to be sensitive because obviously there's family members involved. Um, but the police put out this guy's name and they said, uh, do not approach, he's dangerous. Um, they were calling him the Facebook fugitive because he was known to have contacted a number of women on Facebook and social media and that's how he met uh, Claire. She met him on Facebook. Um, anyway, obviously as a, as a journalist we were covering this manhunt that closed all the ports and the airports and um, they believed he was somewhere local. But anyway, six days later they, they found his body, so he hung himself. Um, and in a way, it was kind of like case closed, really, because from, you know, there's no immediate threat to the public anymore. This man's been caught, um, you know, and Claire's case was just passed on to a coroner, as, as, as they do, that Claire's death. Um, and that was it, really, in terms of my dealing with that case at the time. You know, unfortunately, murders were happening and I, co I covered that murder. But the inquest took ages to... Usually an inquest will happen within six months of, of somebody's death. Uh, it took ages and there was loads of questions being asked about her contact with the authorities. She'd been in touch with police. She'd been in touch with the probation service. She'd been in touch with women's services. Um, so the inquest didn't happen until about two years after Claire's death. And that's where I met Claire's dad, Michael. Um, so I covered the inquest, and it was absolutely shocking, some of the things that were coming out as part of the inquest. Uh, the fact that she'd been in touch with the police, but information from the police wasn't passed on to the probation service, and the probation service knew that this guy had a history of going from different partners who he'd met on Facebook, and he'd, he'd threatened one woman at knife point, he'd kidnapped another. And, and all this was being discussed amongst the services, so the women's, um, the, the, the women's aid services that she'd gone to for help for domestic abuse, uh, the probation services that said the police, um, but none of it was passed on to Claire. And anyway, there was loads of failings around Claire's case anyway, which came out as part of the inquest. But the coroner said, and Michael, um, Claire's dad in particular, picked up on this, because why wouldn't you? The coroner said, why do people not have the right to know if their partner has a history of violence? Um, and Claire's dad was adamant that had Claire known that this guy had done all these things to other women, that she would have walked away. Um, you know, one of the things in domestic abuse situations is that um, women always think it's their fault because that's the way they're made to feel, that you caused me to get angry, I only did this because you made me do it. Um, whereas actually, if there was information available to say, well, it's not you, it's actually, this guy's done it before and he's done it to this person, this person. So anyway, um, after the inquest, I spoke to Michael because it really stuck with me. It was like, you know, when a cor a cor the coroner herself, Jennifer Philemon, said, I'm going to be writing to the Home Secretary about this because I just don't understand why there's all this red tape around it and why it's data protection. So I said to Michael, whilst that's all happening behind the scenes, let's do a campaign. You know, let's call it Claire's Law. Let's do a campaign in Claire's memory. So that's where it started, really. And the idea of this was just to kind of look as to why this information wasn't available, what was stopping it from being available. So as a journalist, I began to research. Um, I spoke to the, um, uh, the Association of Chief Police Officers, and it was interesting to hear their head on domestic abuse saying that, actually, this is something, uh, you know, we're, we're, I think he said, we're aware of about 50,000 serial perpetrators across the country and that's men that have 
committed a crime before, a domestic abuse incident, going from relationship to relationship. And they basically said there's nothing we can do about it in terms of passing on that information because of data protection. So, um, and, but they said it was something that they'd actually raised as an issue in 2010. Claire died in 2009, 2010, they'd said, and obviously Claire's, um, Claire's um, inquest was in 2011. We started the Claire's Law campaign in 2011. So the police were saying it was an issue that needed to be looked at. I was speaking to the domestic abuse services, women's aid, and they were saying, yeah, you know, most of the time when we have what's called a MARAC meeting, which is when a woman's um, come forward and is at risk, uh, and they do a, a sort of risk assessment on her situation and how much support she needs, they were basically saying, sometimes we're privy to this information that this person involved, this perpetrator, this guy, has committed these offences before, but we can't say anything. Um, and of course the police as well, they have that uh, data on record and, and weren't able to say anything. So we went to Parliament, we held debates, we got the local, uh, got the local MP involved. Um, and again, you know, I started a petition because I thought, oh, I'm going to see what the general public thinks about it. Um, and it was insane how many people were signing that petition. Uh, similar sort of thing, you know, where you're just taken aback about how many people suddenly, it's not just you involved in a case and, you know, Claire's dad, such an amazing, he's no longer with us anymore, but such an amazing, strong character to take all that emotion that he was feeling over the loss of his daughter, to want to push that into changing and making a change so it didn't happen to anybody else. Um, people were signing this petition and I got in touch with some of the, the women that did sign it. Uh, one person in particular who I did an interview with anonymously said, she had started, she'd got into a new relationship with a guy um, and immediately his ex-wife had contacted her just to say, he'll abuse you, he starts off like this, but then all of a sudden he'll become controlling, um, he hit me with a glass bottle, he'll do it to you. And she said, I thought it was just sour grapes. I just thought, do you know what? You're just jealous because I'm with your man now, and etc. And she said, but if I had had access to Claire's Law, when he started to become a bit controlling with me, I might have put a request in and that might have come back as a disclosure that actually all those things that that woman was saying were true. So, um, you know, she said, unfortunately, she learned the hard way because she found out, as the ex-wife had, had said, that this is the type of person she was getting involved with. So we had the petition. We took the petition to Downing Street, knocked on the door at number 10, delivered it. Um, and that's what got the national media's attention. I always remember, because I'm you know, a local journalist fighting a local cause, thinking something's got to change or something so tragic. Um, but all of a sudden, as you, know, you guys have experienced as well, you get the national media involved and suddenly they pick up on it. And I remember at the time, um, we'd, we'd had these debates in Parliament, we'd taken the petition to Downing Street, and I was at a party on Saturday night <laughs> and I got a phone call from my boss at the time and they were doing the paper review for Sunday the next day on Sky and it was about 11 o'clock at night and then my phone's going, I think, why's my boss ringing? I'm <laughs> 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 being um, called out. <laughs> yeah, and I was just like trying to write myself a hello. <laughs> and uh, he's like, have you got Sky News on? I was like, no, I'm at a party. <laughs> you switch off, boss. Um, anyway, so the, 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 we're talking about Claire's Law. And this this was my campaign. Nobody else talked about Claire's Law. Like, they're talking about Claire's Law. It's on the front of the mail on Sunday. Wow. Claire's Law, Claire's picture, Home Secretary's considering um, bringing in Claire's Law. And I was just like, whoa, where did that come from? And that was kind of the next, next thing. We were down at the Home Office meeting Theresa May, who was the Home Secretary at the time. And um, it, all of a sudden it was like, right, yeah, we're going to take this, we're going to run with it, we're going to launch a pilot scheme and see how it, it goes down. So they piloted it in four areas. Um, it was Greater Manchester, Gwent, Nottingham, and I should know the other place, but I can't remember. I think it was Wiltshire. Um, there was four places that piloted it. So they did that for a year. The results were incredible. You know, hundreds of people were making applications. Um, and that was just off. You know, if you think about the publicity behind it, not really anybody knew about Claire's Law. So this was just off those four pilot areas. And then on International Women's Day, uh, 2014, so nine years ago tomorrow, they rolled it out nationally. And they basically said, from therefore, everybody has the right to know and the right to ask if their partner has a history of violence. So that moment was incredible, because that was England and Wales. And then after that, Scotland followed suit the year after. 
Um, and then, incredibly, Australia is now looking at it and it's coming to place in Canada as well. And I often get contacted by, um, you know, some media outlets over there saying, Claire's law, how does it work? Where does it come about? Um, I can talk about how it works, by the way, you know, like... Yeah, yeah, tell us, cause so people understand, I think, because it is, you know, it's, again, look like these two women, a relatively simple idea, which seems ridiculous, it wasn't in place. Yeah, and, and again, you know, unfortunately, it took something so tragic to bring that to the surface and say, like, a change has got to be made here. So how it works is, um, there's the right to know and the right to ask. So the right to know is, say, for example, police are aware of somebody. As I talked about when I was doing my research, the Association of police, uh, Chief Police Officers said, we know of all these men that are going to, you know, relationship to relationship. So it might be that a guy's come out of prison or somebody uh, who they're aware of is now in another relationship and the police might take a step back and think, mm, we might need to warn that person that, that do they know that if his background, what he's done, etc. So that would be, the police would make an assessment on that and that would be the right to know. So that disclosure would come from the police because they might have a concern about um, who this guy's in a relationship with. The right to ask is open to everybody. So that could be the, it, it's one of, again, as with everything you get criticized when you're trying to bring about change, but one of the kind of things that was the criticism of Claire's Law um, was, and I'll tell you a story about that, that was incredible when Michael was in parliament. Uh, but one of the things that an MP said, and it was often asked is, is this not big brother? Is this not like we're, we're just, you know, d delving into people's private life and, you know, it's not fair that, you know, someone's able to ask and they don't want, you know, might not want you to know what they've been up to. And, uh, and uh, it is shocking. Uh, an MP actually stood up and said that when we were having a debate in parliament. and. Michael, I mean, you, if you Google Michael Brown, like I said, he's, he passed away a couple of years ago. Um, really small little Scottish man. And he was so, you know, so fiery. And he sat there. And I didn't realise he'd done this. But this is, so we're in the House of Parliament, the House of Commons. And um, I sat there in this long bench, it's a big wooden room. And this MP says, well, I want to, you know, I don't understand. This is like, you know, infringing on people's um, private life. Michael taking his shoes off under the desk, right? <laughs> <laughs> and out of nowhere, he picks these shoes up, slams them down on this big wooden desk, and it like echoed. And he just basically said, I challenge any of you to spend 10 minutes in my shoes, and then you'll understand why this law's needed. And literally, from that moment, he had the room, it was like, whoa, and so true you know so um going back to the right to ask so basically if you're in a relationship and this goes this is where i was talking about the mp you can't just meet somebody and go do you know what before i decide whether i'm going to get her into a relationship with this guy i'm just going to check him out um, <laughs> you have to be in a relationship with them so you have to have been in a relationship with them and you need to have kind of had cause for concern so are they starting to do something that's a bit controlling, you know, being a bit, you know, putting restrictions on you or coercive control or something that gives you a bit of alarm bells that you think, I'm not, not quite happy about this. So in which case you can make an application to police discreetly, confidentially, just to check out whether this is cause for concern. They might come back and they say, actually, there's nothing to disclose. But they might come back and say, yeah, this person's got a history of this, this and this. Um, and it can be third party as well. So we've had instances where um, third party mem family members, sisters, mothers, grandparents, they can make um, applications as well if there's any concerns there around um, um, concern for a relative. That moment you heard Claire's Law was happening, do you remember where you were, how you felt? Do you know what? It was really frustrating as a local journalist because you're always the last to know as much as, <laughs> as, much as you, me and Michael were doing all the digging, the, the trying to control it. And, and certainly for me, for me, it was more about Michael finding out first rather than hearing it on, you know, whatever, BBC, yeah. ITV, Sky News, whatever. Um, so trying to, you know, find out what was going on first was really difficult. But we did get wind that Theresa May, and again, we hadn't, had it as a, this is definitely happening. But we were told that, obviously, the, it was obvious, the pilot scheme had been a success. Um, obviously, I was really close with the police, the main police guy that was leading it, um, the MP, obviously, that was fighting our cause as well. So we had, 
we had a good inkling, 99.9% .9 sure it was going to be rolled out. But again, until it was actually announced on International Women's Day by Theresa May, I didn't know. And uh, yeah, it's, do you know what's always been really weird with Claire's Law? Because we've been part of the campaign all the way through, we've never re you've never really took a step back and gone, yeah. wow, this is, this is making a real difference. And I think it's like you were saying and you were saying, when you get those moments of the, the kids calling you, you know, and when you're hearing about the difference that the, the products are making to people, you don't really realise how much of a difference it's making. And I've had a couple of people contact me just sort of randomly. I mean, I've, I've done talks, I've done a couple of documentaries, and for me, it's about spreading the word about Claire's Law and letting people know it's there to be used as much as possible. Um, but I think until you, you know, I've had a couple of people message me and say, I use Claire's Law, it saved my life. You know, and you just kind of like, wow. It gives you know, goosebumps, doesn't it? It, it yeah. really does, yeah. 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 It's, it's an amazing story, and thank you so much for you. And, you know, you didn't give up, and you kept going, and Michelle lives here, everyone. got some questions so we're going to put the mic out I know we're, we're a little bit over but the women have been so brilliant that uh, it doesn't really matter <laughs> I'll make that executive decision um, we've got one for Natalie from let's have a look here um, tch -tch -tch. Mia Rush is that right Mia is Mia here if not I can ask your question I can hear a little voice somewhere there we go <laughs> This is for Natalie, isn't it? Um, yeah, or do you, you can ask whoever. <laughs> um, how does it feel having your work appreciated and women? So how does it feel to have your work sort of appreciated and acknowledged and also you were Merseyside Woman of the Year? Oh, thank you so much, Mia. Thank you for asking. Um, I'll be honest, I just don't think it's about me, really. Um, it's lovely to have the work that the project did because I'm the chair of the Perry Project Merseyside. We've got a committee of four or five other women who the majority of them have been with us since 2016. Actually, Beth, one of our committee members, I met her in university when she was lead of the homeless, um, the homeless society in the university. And she worked with me to get the meeting set up. And now um, she's doing a PhD at the minute. Um, and has travelled all over and is still involved with the committee. So I'm always really clear that it isn't just me that runs Perry Project Merseyside. I was the founder, but the committee are all fabulous as well. So, um, and secondly, um, the Merseyside win of the year, that was just, um, it's loads of fun to be honest. Um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Like, um, Actually, Claire, who's here um, on the back row there, who works for this <laughs> university, she was the one who nominated me. Um, and I never really don't think I'd ever been nominated for anything like that before. Um, so it was a big surprise. And because it was the nomination was done before COVID, but because of COVID, um, it had to be put on hold. So we, we only sort of like seen the nomination go into effect and in the award ceremony and um, the year after. Um, and it was lovely. I, I, did, I went into there not expecting anything really. We got a table and we were the rowdy people in the place. <laughs> we were having a few wines, we were enjoying ourselves. And the way I looked at it, it was that I was going with people who were really important to me. And it was about us celebrating and spending a nice day together and celebrating other women. And if I won, wonderful. And if I didn't, I've had a nice day. So we come away <laughs> and we won and I wasn't expecting it at all. Um, so it is a really nice and special feeling. But I think with any type of this type of work, you will have your people who are maybe the figureheads or the people who are leading it from sort of, uh, if someone asks for an interview, it's usually me from the Perry Project that does it. It's mm -hmm. me who does maybe, I'd say, about 80% of the interviews and stuff like that. But because what we're doing is trying to make real change and improve people's lives, it is a group effort. So I think everyone on the committee and even everyone in our societies is equally important in this fight. So it was lovely. I had a nice day. I had a new dress. I had my makeup done. And I had a lovely time with my friends and family. <laughs> but um, that for me is a bit of a side sort of note to um, the real work, working with our communities. Yeah. It helps with the PR though for what you need to do. It so, does, yeah. It, yeah. yeah it means to an end and also you've got a new frock. So yeah. This is it. <laughs> <laughs> and I love a new frock. <laughs> I do have some questions here, but in a second, I'll just ask if anyone wants to put their hand up as well. For Alice, um, I've got Ella Murray has got a question. I don't know if Ella is here. If not, I can ask your question. Pop your hand up if you want to ask it yourself. Oh, there we go. <laughs> do you want the microphone? 
Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, I think that's, it's, it's weird um, because I think sometimes when you're doing work like this, people are really quick to put it on you and, and they kind of want this sort of clickbaity moment where you just spill all your guts of trauma and then it's like, oh, we can feel sorry for you and that's why this is something that's worth supporting, which for a long time was something I really resisted. I didn't want to put a lot of myself into my work because I wanted to be taken seriously. And even though if I shared my personal experiences, I still should be taken seriously. It was a big anxiety for me. Um, but I think it's something that I have come to share more because I realized that much of what I thought I was doing was legitimizing the work to people who didn't believe in Stratsafe, um, who didn't believe in the work that I was doing and who didn't think that it was worthwhile. But actually what I realized was more important was speaking and empathizing with people who experience this just like I do. Um, and saying, it's happening to all of us. You know, you're not alone. We're all going through this. We're all experiencing this. We're all struggling with it. I'm struggling with it. And now I've set up something that's gonna be here for you when you're struggling with it. And it is my, my boyfriend enjoys <laughs> sorry, calling me the feminist Batman um, <laughs> because I literally cannot go anywhere <laughs> without being like, you're right. <laughs> I get your cab. He will be walking home, and I'll pr like I'll see one on her own, and I'll be like, it'll be like the radar. I'll, I'll go up to her and be like, you're right, and like, can I? Are you gonna? Are you okay? Going home, and she'll be like, oh yeah, I'm fine. And they'll be like, we can't go anywhere. And I'm like, would you rather I left her? <laughs> um, but it, it's it means that um, like I and it sometimes there is a sense of like you don't know who you're messing with. Um, <laughs> like I had you know there, but it also sometimes means that I'm a, sometimes equipped like. I was, I was traveling, it happens to me all the time. Like I was traveling up here last night and I had a man who, was, I was sitting in the waiting room at York Station about nine o'clock at night because I was changing trains, came down from Edinburgh, changed at York and then came down to Liverpool and, um, and there was a man in the waiting room who was just, I walked into the waiting room and it was entirely men. There was one woman, I went and sat next to her. And then there was a man opposite me who came and sat down and who started like, didn't stop staring at me, it was just like, dead eye staring at me and started like licking his lips and just I was just thought oh god I'm so uncomfortable and even in that moment I'm like what am I you know gonna do and I'm just thinking you know I'm, I hope I'm gonna get out of this okay and you know I texted my friend and she was like you're right and then I was able to get on the train but um it's sometimes nice when I was on the bus recently and there was a man who was being really inappropriate to all the women on the bus. And when you get on the bus, you don't know what's been happening when you weren't on the bus. So I got on and he started being really inappropriate to me. And I moved and he was really unhappy about that because it was further for him to yell. Yeah. Um, and then a young woman got on and she sat directly behind him because she didn't know what had been happening when she got on the bus. And she sat next to him and he started like being, you know, inappropriate towards her. And I just did, I like stared at her intensely. I was like waiting for her to turn and look at me. And then as soon as she turned and looked at me, I just went, like tap the seat next to me and was like, come and sit down. And then we had a chat and I was like, you all right? And she was like, yeah, I'm fine. And then when I got up, I told the bus driver and I was like, is this man making women uncomfortable? And he's made me uncomfortable and he's about to make a really young girl uncomfortable. You need to do something about it now. And he was like, all right. And I was like, no, what are you gonna do about it? And like the people on the bus are looking at me like, you're holding me up, I'm trying to go to Bonnelly, I'm trying to go to the Tesco Superstore. <laughs> um, and I was like, no, he's, when you, you can do something about it now or I'll wait. And it just, hopefully, it means that she was able to get home okay. But I think it, it's, it's hard because sometimes I'm in situations where I feel like I'm equipped to handle it. And sometimes I'm in situations where I feel ashamed or embarrassed. I'm like, I should be handling this better. I shouldn't, I, you know, I should know what to do now. Um, but I just do my best. And, you know, it definitely has been a very liberating thing to share things that have happened to me and to share my experiences. And even though people can be very abusive online and be like, who would cat call you, you munter? Which is, oh, I love that. Um, and like, but it's, it's, it's definitely helped me come a long way. And you know, leading with empathy in one, is one of the huge things. I feel like sometimes, especially women, and when we're talking about women's issues, we're encouraged to not come, you know, not, not plead with empathy, but come at people with statistics. 
And it's like, it's all just a game. It's all concocted. All it is is, is it's trying to stall progress. It's trying to hold up any conversations from happening. And actually, you can go about progress and you can go about change any way that you want. You shouldn't have to moderate or decide how you're going to approach a problem. You decide exactly how you want to and exactly how you feel comfortable. Brilliant. Yeah. Great question, great answer. <laughs> uh, we've got one for Michelle here. Um, Ebony Kempster, are you here, Ebony? I always read people's names out and then you see people go, oh, <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, it's fine. <laughs> um, now that closed law has been established, do you know of any statistics of how many women are using it? Sorry, that was a maths one I've asked you there, isn't it? Yeah. Well, actually, also, I love that you say Chloe like me. It's great. <laughs> um, yeah, I do. I have the latest. I'm only releasing them tomorrow, so should I give you a bit of an exclusive? Yeah. Nobody can put it online or report it. <laughs> um, so, basically, in the last year, um, so the year ending March 2022, which is the latest set of figures across the country, just over, well, the exact figure was 15,666 people wow. have been told <laughs> that their partner has a history of violence. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's up massively on the year before, and the year before that, and the year before that. So, for me, it's incredible that now it's being used. And, I mean, gosh, that's... That's, that's a, a huge, huge, huge number. Absolutely huge. It, it does, it gives me goosebumps yeah. because... It, it, you know, and at the end of the day, and this was one of the arguments that we always said with Claire's Law, it's it's not going to stop domestic violence. It's, it's not. But what it is, is it's a tool. It's a tool in fighting domestic abuse. It's a tool in giving people a choice of what they do with that information. You know, and the thing as well, it put domestic abuse back on the agenda again, you know, and even if that person chooses after hearing that information, which happens quite a lot, that they're not gonna leave that situation, they're happy in that situation, some people already know the information and that they're not interested. Um, you know, but what it does is it, it, it gives them, should you choose to leave, here are some organisations that you can contact. Here's a support network around you. The police are obviously aware of it. Um, and it just it provides more of an avenue for people to make that choice as to whether they leave and, yeah. and, and get away. And something you said earlier on press releases, it'll often have a note, <coughs> domestic incident. And it's almost like it's putting it in a completely different category. Like, that happened in the house. That happened at home. Yeah. But this way, it gives people, as you say, it's important to have that network there to help if you want to get out. And actually, the police have stopped doing that now, quite rightly, because you know it doesn't matter if someone's if someone was assaulted in the street. It, like we were saying, it would be massive. It, it you know it'd be everywhere. But just because it's happening behind in your own home or behind four walls, it, it shouldn't make a difference. So it shouldn't matter if it's a domestic murder or a murder in the street, you know, it's murder at the end of the day. So they have stopped doing that now, quite rightly. Have we got anyone that wants to ask a question that's not on my list? You can just pop your hand up and we can, uh... there you go. I've got a question for Alice. Um, have you had any feedback or comments from the police on services provided, like maybe like them to promote services or something like that? Um, it's really, it's been, it's, it's odd, because we've definitely, um, we hear, tend to hear from individual police officers or people who work within communities, and they say, um, oh, I've heard about this and it's, it's great. Um, and we've met with people, um, and I think it, it seems to be not really. Um, you know, people will meet with us and say, oh, we're looking to start something ourselves locally. Um, and so we'll meet with them and we'll, we'll give them kind of a framework of what we've done or we'll explain the issue to them. Sometimes we simply say, you know, you can promote our service. Um, not in any way that we're doubting them, but just like if you want, you know, posters and things like that. We have posters that we send out across the UK and we have assets that we send people to put up in bars. It started with me going around Edinburgh and lying to the first bar I went into. I went into a bar and was like, everyone else around here has these posters up. <laughs> Why don't you? And they were like, oh, well, if everyone else does. And then I could go into every subsequent bar and be like, yeah, they've all got posters up. Um, so we've sent, you know, done stuff like that. Um, but really there seems to be, and I thought it's quite controversial to say, there seems to be a bit of a rejection or a, or a, a, a slight feeling of discontentment with Stratsafe um, because we know that bodies are aware of us. We know that the government, the UK government, is aware of us, um, and yet they um, 
refuse to fund us uh, or refuse to acknowledge any correspondence from us. Um, we know that uh, the, a number of police forces are aware of us um, and seek not to engage with us um, and all kind of support us or share the service in any way. I think, you know, you could, we could argue, we could say, we're doing your job, why aren't you doing your job? We're currently trying to mediate um, a threat to public safety, why aren't you medi mediating those threats to public safety? We're not taking that approach. Um, but that seems to have kind of been the reception that we've had. And of course that may all be me being a complete horrible cynic. Um, but we're trying to say, look, we're trying to do something. If you want to support that or if you want to implement something similar, please do. If you want to spread the word in your local communities, please do. If you want to fund and support us doing something like this, please do. We're not approaching it on this basis of we're picking up the slack. We could, but we're not. So it's been a slightly confusing and frustrating thing because... Um, Anyone who we speak to is like, oh, the government should be on this. The government should be funding this. You know, who have you spoken to? Do you know any MPs? And it's like, it all, it seems to be this kind of weird no man's land of lack of contact, which we try, we write correspondence and say, you know, are you interested in supporting us? Are you interested in spreading the word? You know, or what kind of things are you funding? Will you fund organizations that are existing in this space that are doing similar work to us? But, um, yeah, so it's it's hard. We've had you know police officers reach out to us. We've not seen anything be implemented. We've taken meetings and they've said, oh yeah, we'll look to do something similar in the area, and, and nothing has happened. Um, I think the word of Strat Safe is out farther than I would imagine. Than I always think. I always think no one's ever heard of it, and then people have heard of it, and I'm always really shocked. So there may be some sort of level of local awareness that maybe police departments don't feel like they need to fulfil. I don't know. Um, but also we are a relatively young organisation, we're only two years old and I think maybe, <laughs> I also have a slight theory that people are waiting on it to see if we, you know, exist with any like, kind of longevity before they invest anything like, you know, time or money or public support. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. It also is sometimes not entirely surprising that the government isn't interested in funding work like this. Um, or really supporting it. Sometimes you get really wonderful things like with Claire's Law where support has come behind it. Um, but sometimes, you know, people aren't interested. So it's, so it's all about just keeping up the pressure and, and trying to do things. And, and like you were saying, it was something that I really was like, oh yeah, I identify with that. It was just like trying to let people know about it. Like with Claire's Law, you're just trying to be like, look, I just want people to know about it so they can use it if they ever need. That's what we're trying to do with Strat Safe. We're just trying to put the word out there. People can call us if they need. Was that a helpful answer? <laughs> um, I think one more question. Should we do one more? Yeah, yeah go on. We'll squeeze one more, and I'll get in. I'll get in trouble. Is there anyone else who wants to ask a question? You can pop your hand up, or I can go to my list. I'm trying to look out. Everyone moves, and then I think, are you putting your hand up or not? <laughs> do you know I've got a question, Michelle? Who answers the door at Downing Street? You know when you knock on the door. <laughs> who? It's not. It's not the Prime Minister, is it? They're not there in the slippers and go, oh, come in. <laughs> well, no, no. Hello. <laughs> um, it's um, yeah. There's like a, an officer that is like it's very a, oh, formal. Then. Yeah, it's very formal. <laughs> um, and actually, Larry the cat came out when really? we were there. Yeah, which was I was more excited about meeting Larry. To be yeah, honest we with all you. know Larry the cat. I mean, yeah. let's face it, no one knows it who's in number ten now because it changes that often. But we all know Larry the cat. I right, tell you what, I'll refer to this list very quickly. Let's go for. I'm just plucking one out here. Poppy. Uh, Poppy, you've got a question for Natalie on my list. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Um, do you think that if the government provided free reusable period products, it would promote the use and help the environment? Fantastic question, Poppy. Thank you for that. Um, yes, so um, it's a bit of a mixed answer because when we started sort of providing pads and um, tampons, um, we also think it's important for us to think of like reduce and reuse and recycle as well. But what sometimes people tend to do is say, well, if people are homeless, they should be using reusable ones anyway. And we don't like that because what it sort of implies is the idea that homeless people shouldn't have choice in, in the same way everyone else should. So there needs to be an, an opportunity as an offer. Um, but it's also giving people the choice to sort of use what they, they could. Um, for me, we sort of do promote that because not just sort of, um, you know, um, cups or um, the pants, which are fabulous at the moment, um, but also sort of you know, reusable, rewashable things and things. So there's lots of different ways that we can look at. And I think um, looking at environmentally friendly options is really important. So for me, I think it would be fantastic if the government did 
sort of champion that, but I don't think that that would be the answer completely. I think we need to make sure that people still have freedom of choice to access and experience their um, menstruation in, in a way that they wish. But I think the sort of a caveat to that would be it's important to provide education alongside that because one of the reasons that at the beginning we didn't really champion the cups for example wasn't nothing to do with we didn't think they were good but it was this idea that we just get cups and just give them to homeless women and then just expect them to know yeah. what to do with them um knowing that they need to be cleaned that they need a sink to do that that they need you know to, be, to, to have a hygienic environment and does that person have that so we wanted to make sure it was accompanied with some form of support and education so that we get the best out of that and um, so we are really behind this idea but I think there needs to be a bit of a wider sort of thought process around the different options but then also not just about products because what I haven't mentioned is we talk a lot now the Prairie Project Maisie said about menstrual equity where they're sort of moving away from period poverty because I think people automatically think when you wear poverty finance money mm, you know yeah. from that perspective whereas we're talking about equity for all that they can experience a period and it could be you know, something that they have the products for, that they're not made to feel ashamed or embarrassed about it either, and that they've got the re relevant education around their body. So some of the things that we're doing as an organisation is we're going to be running sessions like for parents, how to speak to your kids about periods, for example. We're going to be doing sessions just around menstrual equity in general and what that actually means so people have the vocabulary and sort of the information to be able to have these wider talks within their environments as well. Um, and we're just going to be talking a little bit more about our campaign inside of things as well. You know, through our experience in the last seven years, we've went from, you know, oh, wow, this is an issue to, oh, wow, this is an issue. <laughs> you know, let's get like the uh, torches out, the banners out and all of that. So for us, we want to make sure that it isn't a one focused sort of solution to this. It needs to be something which is wider, which is dealt with on a sort of holistic level, not just it being about the products, but it being about the education and the environment. I think listening to um, both Alice and Michelle today, you know, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about touches on the same thing, whether it be misogyny, whether it be patriarchy, whether it be sort of, you know, the violence against women and girls and about how all of these things intersect and how about, we're made to feel embarrassed about something because it's feminine, because it's something that, you know, is made, is, 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 we're not supposed to feel great about in any way, shape or form. Um, and, you know, we often use this, if, if this was happening to men, people would have been dealt with years ago, they would have even had like computerized, motorized pads. <laughs> <laughs> There'd be all kinds going on. So I think for us, it's about us keeping that pressure up um, and looking at various different ways for us to solve the problem, but having reusable options would be one of the ways to go. Fab. Do you know what? I'm not going to look at Sarah, so she can't tell me to solve There's one question <laughs> on here that's really good, and I think it's a really good way to end it. It's for Michelle, and it's by Emily Gillard. Is Emily here? I think, I think probably, well, Michael, because again, you know, he was such a force of nature that, and, and do you know what was good about Michael? He was always, always open about saying it was the women behind, behind him that got him to where he was. So he used to describe it as he was a voice in the wilderness. But he used to always credit me. Every time he was speaking on national media, he'd always say, without Michelle Livesey, I wouldn't be here today. Without Hazel Blears, who was the MP from Salford, who was Claire's MP, I wouldn't be here today. And then taking it right back to the coroner, who was also a woman, Jennifer Leeming, without her making those recommendations, I wouldn't be here today. So it's one of those things where he was a very much a, a female um, sort of advocate for women in terms of saying that, you know, making a change like this, you know, I, I, and again, what he used to say is until, you know, I'm very lucky that I've never experienced domestic abuse, you know, and why would you even think about domestic abuse if it's not, you know, something that you're experiencing in your life? But when you look at those figures, when you hear about how many people are using Claire's Law, when you hear the figures, the shocking figures about how many women are being killed, you know, a week um, because of domestic abuse, it opens your eyes to it. And in a way, it kind of shocks you. So I think for me, it was... As a local journalist, I had the opportunity to bring about change and I was able to 
keep going with it. And when we were told no, it was like, well, what can I do? What, how, how can you make a big noise? How can you get it talked about? And because I was in the media as well, I, I knew the right things to be kind of pushing out and saying and, and trying to get the attention of the national media as well. Like I say, the more things are talked about, even now, doing talks like this for me it's telling everybody about Claire's Law because still even though the government passed it as law and it's in the statutory books now it's part of the domestic abuse bill and police forces now have a duty to tell people and take this seriously it's still not talked about enough there's no advertising campaigns about Claire's Law unless the individual police forces are doing it themselves um so you know for me it's about it's about spreading that word and I think the motivation is I certainly when I saw the pilot results come through it was like wow this really is you know when I saw the names on that petition when I heard people's stories it was like this has to happen this has to change because you know it when somebody when you're working with people who've lost children like loved ones and they're using that emotion to push for change and do something that's going to stop it happening to anybody else I couldn't sit back and just go right okay well you know for me it was like we have to do something about this and because you know we had such a powerful voice of, of Claire's story such a tragic story but now her legacy is huge and you know Michael's legacy now that he's not here anymore his legacy is huge I wish I could ring him and say Michael 15 and a half thousand people have been told that the partner's a history of violence and you know it's for me that's that's the difference and that's what pushes you to to, to, to go on and you know I'm a campaigning journalist I've done other campaigns and you know I've, I've and every time it's working with families who've lost loved ones and it's knowing that they can turn that pain that they're experiencing into something positive and so I think having a platform to do that as a journalist it's there's no better feeling really so that's what kind of pushes me to do what I do. That was perfect. I just wanted to squeeze that question. Now Sarah, 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 I'll be going, oh my God, shut up, shut up, shut up. <laughs> right, okay, right. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know about you, but I've been inspired by all three women today. I think they're all absolutely fantastic. I work in sport media and I always say, when I started it, just horrendous being the only girl in a room and all that kind of stuff and the comments I've had. And I've always said I wanted to leave sport media a better place than I found it. Well, these women are definitely left, going to leave the world a far better place than they found it. And there is no better legacy for any of you. So let's hear it again for our panel today. Brilliant. Absolutely. Absolutely.